from Tallahassee. What, what if you have time for a couple of questions? Not on the runway, we don't. Okay. <laughs> Do you feel like the consumer movement is dying? No. It just needs uh, leaders. It needs organizers uh, because public interest research groups funded and controlled by students with their full-time lawyers and scientists and economists fighting for the good life, fighting for justice, fighting to solve community problems. And I hope that uh, here in Tallahassee the students will do likewise and that the trustees of the university will recognize uh, a good thing when they see it. That is citizen action and research and a better education for the students. And you're hopeful that? And there are students and faculty and a lot of talent to solve these problems. One is, of course, the problem of pollution. Both land pollution, water pollution, air pollution, uh, the uh, e effect on uh, drinking water safety, uh, and certainly uh, this uh, state relies on uh, the perception uh, by many Americans that it's a, a relatively clean state environmentally. And so I think that uh, the students have a great role to play both in terms of their scientific work and in terms of their uh, publicity work uh, to uh, turn the corner and make uh, Florida a, uh, a place where health and safety and good environment prevail. enactment of the National Consumer Co-op Bank uh, law, uh, the ability of food co-ops and housing co-ops and health co-ops and repair co-ops to get credit will be facilitated nationwide. And I think we'll see more consumers increasing their control of, uh, uh, over their own economic destiny through co-ops, uh -huh. students as well. Uh -huh. I'm going to ask you this question again. What do you see as the greatest consumer problems in Florida? Well, I think a, a serious one is the effect of environmental pollution on the health and safety of consumers and workers. Uh, Florida has a fragile, though beautiful, environment, and the pollution of the air, water, and soil, the, the impact on uh, uh, underground water sources that are used for drinking pur purposes uh, is, in, is becoming more and more serious. And I think the students and the faculty at Florida's universities, with their ability to uh, engage in scientific uh, inquiry, and public advocacy uh, can make the state a better place to live and can open up uh, all kinds of other opportunities such as the acceleration of solar energy uh, here in Florida uh, and uh, the development of a, of a uh, more consumer-oriented energy policy. It's about time the universities in Florida uh, put their knowledge to work to solve Florida problems and stop just acting as if they were primarily uh, a trade school for corporations uh, within Florida and throughout the country. Do you have any personal or political ambitions? No. Are you going, what, are you going to be down there with us? I'll be down there. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I have, have an extra Just that he's riding around in a Ford Pinto bearing a huge bumper sticker warning, don't tailgate. <laughs> also, now I'm told he spends his spare time visiting the sets where skin flicks are produced to check the mattresses for flammability. <clears throat> oh, his number one consumer advocate, Ralph Nader, on the role of student citizen participation in our society.
Thank you, Dr. Moore, and la ladies and gentlemen. I didn't quite know what uh, the jokes were because I couldn't hear in the back, but I hope they didn't relate to hot dogs. <laughs> My topic uh, this afternoon is one that relates to you and uh, education in America and the connection between uh, what you're trying to achieve and what you can achieve uh, for a better society. One of the biggest problems uh, affecting students uh, while they're going through university is that somehow there's very little time uh, for them to think uh, about their role in society. Not that there isn't time, but the way the courses are structured and extracurricular activities and uh, uh, the uh, time-consuming practice of apathy uh, <laughs> prevents them from seeing uh, themselves as, as, a, uh, as a unit in American society that can be very humanizing in terms of its impact. So I'm going to try to give you a broader view. See, you're coming to this auditorium. Uh, you're, you're, you're thinking about your courses, about your personal problems, about what you'd like to do, uh, about your relations with your fellow students and faculty. Uh, and I, I'm coming from uh, a different kind of perspective where, where I see you as uh, not uh, fulfilling a fraction of your potential uh, in terms of your own capability and uh, the assets that you can bring uh, to making for a better society. Uh, one of the faults of a complex nuclear power, and you see a uh, physis physicist say, well, I'm, I'm only a physicist, I can't talk about the effects of uh, radiation, and then you see all the micro specialties under all those other uh, professions, and it's increasing. And as a result, it fractures the ability of the human personality to make moral judgments in conjunction with his, his or her chosen work. And this is something which you can uh, ponder uh, from a vantage point while you're at school that you may not have an opportunity to do after you graduate. So point one is uh, you should view your years at university as uh, very priceless years, not years just to put your time in, get a degree, so you can enhance your economic opportunities in the job market. These are priceless years because you may never again be as free uh, to engage in the uh, analysis uh, and evaluation uh, of the uh, state of our society and your role in it. Uh, you may never again be as free to experiment, pioneer, question, challenge, uh, and initiate uh, the things that you'd like to do if you were free. And once you get out of school, and once you have both uh, occupational and family responsibilities, uh, you may not have an opportunity uh, to do what you can do while you're a student and if you don't uh, engage in these kinds of fundamental analysis about yourself and society while you are a student, then you may uh, make certain that you don't have the opportunity after you graduate uh, to do likewise. Do you think it's uh, an accident that affects millions of people? I'll take five or ten minutes and tell about what they did. And we asked them to answer three questions. Uh, why did they do it? How were they treated when they did do it? And would they do it again? And all of them said, no matter what they suffered, that they would do it again because they had a value in life, uh, as they saw it, which uh, made it impossible for them to live with themselves and their conscience if they went along and covered up or condoned uh, activities that were injuring innocent people uh, all over uh, the land. And we brought them to, together in a conference, and then we published a book called Whist Whistleblowing. And we're, I'm going to leave this in the library, because I think that it is the rare student who is not going to, after graduation, be exposed to this great dilemma of what happens when he or she is working for an organization and sees something that he or she doesn't like in terms of the way the organization operates, whether it's uh, violating uh, pollution laws or uh, defrauding consumers uh, or wasting the, the company or the agency's resources uh, or behaving in other disreputable ways. Uh, the, uh, the decision will have to be made personally as to whether to look the other way, to say I only work here or I'm only following orders 
or the decision to say, I'm a free individual, I have a conscience, I will not have it trammeled uh, for uh, short-term considerations uh, or other factors that demean the status of an individual under our Constitution. That's going to be a very tough decision, uh, but it won't be tough after a few months or years if you do look the other way, because then basically you will become part of a get-along-by-going-along syndrome, and you won't have any more torment uh, because you will have stopped, uh, you will stop uh, looking at yourself as a sensate human being in moral or ethical terms. You just throw in the towel, in effect. Now, looking at students as a national asset requires more than euphoric exhortation. It requires a hard-headed uh, look at what is it that comprise the students as assets? What are the components? Number one, you're about at the peak of your idealism. And if you don't believe it, give yourself a few years. <laughs> that itself is an asset in the sense that that you're not raging inside of you with idealistic fervor, uh, but you still remember what you used to uh, think about uh, five or ten years ago, uh, and you still also uh, are able to make certain judgments without worrying about the boss, uh, without worrying about certain constraints that may come on, in on you later on. Number two, one of the things you're supposed to be learning here at university is how to acquire information, including information that may be hard to get, information that is not in the library, although some libraries are run in such a way that it is hard to get, or information that uh, is, uh, is a challenge to you to analyze and put in some meaningful terms for human understanding. This could be laboratory uh, data, it could be uh, uh, the kind of data that you get through surveys and questionnaires. It could be going down to city hall or state government offices and digging out uh, documents and records uh, or depositions and, or what have you. Now, not many people who want to try to improve their community in our country uh, have these kinds of skills. Uh, if they did have them, they tend to, uh, to be diminished through non-use. Not only that, but they don't usually have laboratories within walking distance. They, 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 they don't have uh, scientists on the faculty within walking distance. They don't have a library uh, that they can retrieve this information. I receive many letters from people around the country who say they want to do this and they want to do that. By way of uh, over 20 uh, contaminants, including a number of cancer-causing substances in the drinking water. And that comes from po polluting the underground sources of water. So you'll learn all that, and then when you finish, you've got something to contribute to the community, a report on the drinking water in this area of Florida with recommendations. So you've learned more about science, you've learned uh, something about citizen action uh, and skills, and you've made a contribution uh, to the community. Uh, I think we should hold universities and colleges up to a higher standard in terms of the kind of resources they are using. and the uh, ability of these resources to uh, perceive and solve local, state, or national problems. After all, uh, the link between knowledge and action uh, should not be foreign to a university uh, a campus. It should be part of the process of developing empirical data, developing abstract principles, testing these principles and theses, uh, and continually uh, being rooted in the uh, common uh, problems and concerns uh, of the people of the country. Now you can do this uh, same thing in your political science courses. In fact, it's even more probably fun. For example, suppose one of your political science courses was focusing on the study of Congress. And you know how most political science students study Congress. They have a big 600-page book written by a political science professor called Congressional Government, or some, uh, some sort of title, and they chew up part of the book every week, and they may do a, a paper uh, on some aspect of Congress based on library research, and then at the end of the course, they take an exam. Now, the problem with that is that most of it is forgotten very quickly, and that it is not rooted in the current uh, experience of students very often. That is.
So the letter arrives the one Monday morning and said, big government for you. You see, big bad government for you. Or re-elect me and I will make sure that inflation is reduced. Or re-elect me and I'll uh, of the population. Well, you will get cooperation from your senators. They will write you back a very nice letter. Uh, they will even consent to an interview. You can interview their staffs as part of Congress can flunk anymore, which is a bad sign. What test would you have Congress pass or flunk? At what point would you say uh, we should turn the majority of these uh, legislators out of office? What would be the standards? Well, they make it so that nobody's responsible for these problems in the country of ours and expanding our in this country. We have eradicated some of the big epidemics like smallpox and typhoid, diphtheria, but we now have diseases uh, that are coming up, pollution diseases, emphysema, for example, cancer. Most cancer comes from environmental contamination, radioactive materials, uh, pollution, benzene, a whole host of chemicals that are going into the air, water, soil, and food. And what are we doing about that? The companies are basically saying to, to, the, to, the, to the United States of America, don't force us to reduce the amount of pollution violence on innocent people because we can't afford it. What do you mean you can't afford it? You can't afford to reduce violence? That's the number one priority of a civilized society. Number two, you're not spending by your own records, corporations. More than 5% of pre-tax profits on pollution control equipment and that's outrageously low level, particularly since you can write it off on taxes at a very generous level given to you by the people of this country. And finally, finally, we have problems like a rampant epidemic of gonorrhea and syphilis. We haven't even made a dent in that problem. In fact, it's getting worse. And yet we have the trained people to, to, to make a serious uh, in, in incursion on that problem. We've got certainly great medical knowledge about how to stop it, but we haven't been able, you know, we get more missiles, Russia gets missiles, then the Chinese and the Indians, and pretty soon there'll be 40 countries with atomic weapons. And how is it going to end? Unless we have arms control. Well, we all know how it's going to end. It's going to end with disaster. We have now such weaponry, the Russians and ourselves, that the people are not told uh, of their full destructive potential in any graphic f form. You know, years ago, the uh, Department of War, before it was uh, uh, renamed the Department of Defense, would parade around our tanks and our artillery, and they would, they would tell people exactly what these uh, weapons could do. Well, about 15, 20 years ago, it was decided that you don't tell the American people the full destructive capability. You use vague words like, uh, a mutual deterrence, uh, single strike capability, things like that. And uh, Schlesinger, for example, once told a physicist, he said, I, I am certainly glad the American people don't know the destructive potential of our existing weapons because it'll never go along with even more powerful weapons that we need. Now, how destructive? The, your average Polaris sub, which is floating around with its Russian counterpart in the oceans, can destroy a hundred cities, you know, just like that. And with growing, urban re or, or growing world urbanization, uh, we are now building the Trident sub, which can destroy 300 cities. Now just list 300 cities in the world and see what kind of incredible destructive potential these weapons have. Well, as a society, are we debating this or are we leaving it to a few negotiators and a few politicians and a few defense contractors? Well, let me ask you. From your own experience, how many of you have heard or seen of Morris the Cat? Can I see the hands? Morris the Cat? Okay. Now let me ask you another question. How many of you have heard or seen Dr. Herbert York? Dr. Herbert York, anybody? Okay. Now, Morris the Cat and its successors <laughs> reaches 200 million Americans or so regularly and it's selling something of crucial importance to the future of this country. <laughs> cat food. I sometimes wonder how cats and dogs survived before 1950, before they had Alpo and Nine Lives and so on. Now, Dr. Herbert York is the leading uh, student and interpreter of the arms race in the country. I think most people would agree, certainly right up there. 
He was part of the Manhattan Project. He was an advisor to President Eisenhower. He's an expert in the whole R&D area and weapons. And now he's a professor at the University of California, San Diego. He's written many books and articles which are analyzing the arms race and showing what has to be done by way of arms control. And yet this man, who has a, the issue of, the, of our generation, cannot have one thousandth of the access via television, which is our airwaves, to the American people that a Morris the Cat has. Now, if a Martian came to this country and was told that, what would that Martian conclude? That Martian would conclude that our society is in the grip of a commercial hysteria controlled by corporations who will not stop unless they dominate our communication system from A to Z. 200 million Americans in this country that's better today than 10 years ago. Maybe you can. Vietnam War is over. One or two other things. The number of traffic casualties on the highways diminished. But almost all the problems that you read about 10 years ago are worse today, including unemployment, inflation, certainly the perceived corruption in government, the corporate crime epidemic, or crime in the suites, as we call it. <laughs> certainly the, problem, the problems of world hunger are worse. The problems of arms proliferation are worse. Now, how do we turn it around? First, we have to develop a sense of self-confidence. One, this country is based on the premise which must be continually recognized that every individual citizen counts and every individual citizen can make a difference. The minute we say to ourselves, what can one person do? And if 50 million people say that individually, what we're saying is 50 million people can't do anything. So we have to recover our self-confidence. Now you have a particular problem in that respect. The society you live in requires you to spend an extraordinarily large amount of time got together in the last seven years of, you know, these carburetor proposals. And, and while carburetors can be made to, to be more fuel efficient in terms of their contribution, I, we have never been able to substantiate those claims. I mean, you know, I, I'm the first person who'd, who'd want to discover that, you know, the 100 mile a gallon carburetor. Uh, but I think that the way it's going to happen and the way it's prefer preferably it's preferable to happen is that we'll see more neighborhood and community organization. We will see more uh, expansion of co consumer co-ops with the establishment of the National Consumer Co-op Bank next year, just passed into law. First time that co-ops will ever be able to get credit without being discriminated against and technical assistance. There'll be many more co-ops uh, on campus, for example, as a result. You know, housing, food co-ops, off-campus, uh, communication co-ops. And I think we're going to see uh, major, major inroads in uh, public access to communications, cable TV, which will facilitate more and more communication organization. We're going to see more consumer checkoffs on utility bills, insurance policies, warranties, so that people who want to join group, uh, statewide groups can do so. In short, we're going to see more emphasis on uh, facilitating the ability of like-minded citizens, taxpayers, outside these big institutions, to organize around their own goals. Tenants, for example. Uh, and we will see more, probably more local ownership. For example, there, there's, there's an...